So we're here with James Hayden, who is the winner of last year's edition of the Transcontinental Race. And we're going to take a little bit of a closer look at his bikepacking setup for the race. Thanks for coming along, James. Can you just talk us through to start with the frame and where that's come from? Hi, yeah, okay, so the frame is uh, a Fairlight Cyclist frame. Uh, this edition is the Strail. They have a couple others. Uh, they've just brought out the Secan and they have uh, another one as well. Uh, yeah, it's 58 regular frame made of steel with a carbon fork and it's a pretty robust bike. Cool, and is it the same model of Fairlight that you rode last year? Yeah, I've ridden this model for three editions now. Obviously it's been <laughs> successful yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, it's been, it's been really good, so I haven't felt the need to change. I really like the bike, I really like the way it rides. Uh, it's really, you know, it's, it's robust. I've had no issues, so I just stuck with it. Great. And so moving on maybe to the group set, you've got the new old Tegra on there with DI2, hydraulic disc brakes and rotor chain set including a power meter on there. It's probably not something you'll see on a lot of bikes here at the Transcontinental with the power to max on there. How much do you rely on your power data sort of during the race and after? Uh, during the race, you don't really, really need it. The, the only thing I use it for is the first day or two days when you've actually got some, some decent energy in your legs to just kind of throttle it back and keep, keep it sensible at uh, the climbs and things like that. But the thing that's interesting is looking at the kind of calories and, and things that are burnt after the race. Uh, and just looking at those numbers. And, and, I, and I just leave it on the bike because I use it in training all the time. So I just use it for when I'm racing as well. Cool. And in terms of finishing kit, we've got a few rather unusual things up here. Um, so we've actually got a Canyon seat post on there. Why have you chosen for that one? Uh, just to soften the ride a little bit. So it's, it flexes and it yeah, just softens, uh, softens out the cobbles and the bumps and things that you're going to find in Eastern Europe. And mounted on top of that one, we've got an ISM saddle. I think this is something that you've customized a little bit yourself, is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Every, it, nearly everything on the bike is kind of like a customized or one-off because you can't find things off the shelf that you need for a race as demanding as this. And so I took the padding off a normal ISM saddle yeah. and uh, just, just stripped it back, put some, put some nice leather on there and it's really, really comfortable and uh, it's really stable, which is, is what you need. So moving up to the front of the bike, in terms of finishing kit, we've got the FSA stem and bars on the front there. Interestingly, double wrapped on the front. Is that just for comfort? Yeah, it's stop because you get like uh, you get numb fingers and you're all unnerved down down the both of the, these fingers is going to go numb and you'll kind of lose the feeling across here because it's like a white finger. You know the guys on the road workers you see with the jackhammer. It's yeah. like the same okay. same thing. It's just like this. So you really want like to soften them. I wear gloves as well. Okay, perfect. So that's double wrapped with lizard skin bar tape. And mounted on top of the bars, we've got some profile design aero bars on the front there. It's something that we're seeing a lot of here at the start of this year's Transcontinental. And it's something that you'll be quite used to from your time trialing background. But how long do you expect to spend in the race on those bars? So I'll be spending a significant amount of time in the in the aero bars, and it's it's not just for the aerodynamic benefit; it's also for the kind of um, position and the pressure that you're going to have on the saddle and with, with your undercarriage. And with your Swift cycles, we looked at the different positions, so on the hoods and on the aero bars and in the drops, and not just how that looked, but also the pressure on my saddle with his pressure meter. And we found that the pressure when I was rotated forward with kind of you know the different hip angle in the in the aero bars was significantly less than, than when I was just sat on the hood. So it's got aerodynamic benefit, but it's also got a lot of benefit on reducing the pressure on, on my saddle, which is really, really useful when you're spending a yeah, nine absolutely. days uh, sat on your bum. <laughs> Perfect. And then again up in the cockpit, we've got the Garmin um, 1030. I believe that's not the only one that you've got with you. Is no, that I've got a 1030 there, which I actually borrowed off uh, Steve Abraham, okay, the guy yeah. who did the, uh, you know, who was going for the kind of uh, most miles cycled in a year. He's really, really kind enough to lend me that. And I've got a, I've got a Garmin 1000 as well that I'll take as a, as a spare because uh, Garmin's can be temperamental, as we know, and it's always good to have backups of, of all your routes in, in yeah, different absolutely. places. Great. So in terms of gearing here, it's not your usual uh, setup. What have you got running on this one, James? Yeah. So. It's not about top speed, it's about like uh, the best average speed yeah. and, and having the right gearing for any section. And so we're going to go along some flat stuff and we're going to go up mountains as well. But we're also going to be riding really, really slowly uh, after five days. So you don't need a 53 and you definitely don't need an 11 because it's going to be useless. So I've got a, a 4634 on yeah. the front, which gives me a nice, the 46 gives me a nice kind of chain line. I would run a slightly smaller than 34, but with the power meter, I can't fit a smaller ring on. And then on the back, I'm running a meat shaker set with a 1334. Okay. So 4613 is my biggest gear, but even at 9500 RPM, that's still 27 miles an hour, which is more than I'm going to be going at any point. Great. And then moving on to the wheel setup, 
obviously we'll come on to the, the lights with the dynamo on there, but you've got the head Belgian plus on there. Yeah. That's something that you've run for a few years? Yeah, I've, I've actually used them for four years, since, since I first ever did TCR, because I kind of asked around and looked up what the best, uh, one of the best strong, and strongest rims are, and someone said head Belgium, and I've used them, and they've never let me down. Perfect. And then mounted onto those, we've got some tires from Continental, although almost unbranded because they've got that reflective strip around the outside. Uh, there are 28, I believe. Yep. They look a little bit more though, I think on those wide rims, looking a little bit more like a 32, so they should be pretty comfortable. Yeah. What sort of pressures are you running on those? Uh, yeah, they come up about 32 and I run 70, 75 or about, about there. Perfect. So mounted onto the rotor cranks, we've got not Shimano Otagra, but Shimano Dura Ace pedals. Now what's your reasoning behind that? Uh, yeah, the Dura Ace pedals are the only Dura Ace part I have on the bike. Otegra is great everywhere else, but uh, the Dura Ace pedals got better bearings. Uh, it's got slightly lower Q factor and then slightly lower uh, platform as well. And so I just just went went with these ones, and I've had them for a couple of years. And oh, these ones are actually new this year, but I have ones before, and they, they last forever. Perfect, interesting. And so moving now more onto the specific parts of the bike for the Transcontinental, perhaps. In terms of the lighting setup, you've gone for a dynamo, which again is a very popular choice. Yeah. What are the specifics of your lighting setup? Uh, yeah, so I've got the Son dynamo up front, which yep. powers uh, a supernova front lamp, really, really bright, it's the E3 triple, uh, and you, you really need to see it at nighttime. And then I've got the supernova uh, rear light that connects with the front light and then runs off the dynamo, so that runs all the time. And I've got two USC exposure blazers that charge uh, off USB, and then I run them at nighttime as well. But uh, I like having the dynamo one because I know it's always going to work. Yeah. But then I've got the USB ones as well that I can uh, use as extra light. Great. And, and again, you've got the spare on the front, on the bars there. Yeah, I just got a little flashy thing on the front. I, I've had this supernova for a couple of years now and it's never let me down. I don't expect it to, so I shouldn't really need that flashy light at all. Cool. And in terms of charging for your GPS devices, phones, uh, the, the lights there as well, do you carry a battery pack for that? Yeah, so I have a, I have a battery pack that I can use to charge stuff that I can charge uh, if I stop in a restaurant or a hotel. But I also have a Sinewave USB charger that uh, connects to the Dynamo, and then I can charge uh, the battery pack off that, and then I can charge my electric devices off the battery pack, because you don't want to be charging your electrical devices off the USB charger because uh, of current spikes and yeah. things like that. So you've got options, essentially. Yeah, you've got to have options. <laughs> yeah. You always need more than one way of doing something in case something stops working. Absolutely. And then last but not least, you've got the Rafa uh, bike packing bags on there. Yeah. I believe this one is custom built for you. Yeah, so the full frame bag is a custom thing that, that they kindly did for me because I insisted on it because <laughs> I, I really like running the custom frame bag. Fantastic. Uh, and then I got the rear pack as well, which is kind of going to become commercially available soon. Okay, great. And how do you organize what you're going to be carrying into those two bags? I try and get everything that I might need when I'm cycling along during the day in the main frame bag because you don't want to be stopping and getting stuff out of the rear bag and things because you want to be cycling all the time. And so if I need it, I want to be able to reach in there quickly and get it. Stuff that I might need at night time or if it rains, then I'll keep in the in the big bag at the back because I, if, it, if it's raining, I'm going to have to stop to put on my leg warmers and other things because you don't want to be taking the risk of doing that cycling long when you're tired because you might fall Absolutely. off. Absolutely. And it's pretty light set up in terms of what you're going to need at night. Does that mean you're going to be staying uh, in hotels rather than... Yeah. Last year, I slept in hotels nearly every night. Uh, for, for three hours and I found that worked really well. It allowed me to get a good quality sleep, yep. which led me feeling stronger, uh, or I wouldn't say stronger, but I felt not as bad as quickly because uh, <laughs> you don't feel strong. And, uh, and, and so I don't really carry any sleeping gear this year. I've just got like a rain jacket, some leg warmers and things like that. And so a few last things to wrap it up then. We've got the addition of the top tube bag on there now. What do you keep in that one, James? So in the top tube bag, I've got a few kind of everyday essentials that I'll be using when I'm riding along. Uh, I can show you a couple of things. <laughs> yeah. So I got my headphones for when I'm going to want to listen to music. I might do some uh, like audio recordings on the road again okay. this year that I did last year. Nice. Uh, I got some really nice SPF 50 uh, UVA UVB sun cream because it gets really really hot in Eastern Europe. Uh, I got the same thing, but for my lips because you're going to get really really chapped lips and they're going to be horrible. And then uh, this is my gel. When, uh, when things go wrong and I'm bonking <laughs> in the middle of the night, I got my gel and I got a couple more of these in the bag and then I can neck these back and I've had to use them before and I'll probably have to use them again. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. And in terms of your nutrition then and <laughs> hydration. <laughs> nutrition um, is maybe the wrong word. Yeah. <laughs> eating, eating. Yeah, trying to eat as much as possible. Yeah. Am I right in thinking that you carry most of that in here? Yeah, so I've got uh, a lot of space in the main frame bag. This two zip, so this zip is a small one. I can carry a few little things in here. Yeah. Uh, and then I've got my main compartment in here, my uh, bladder, and the, and the cable that goes up to the front with uh, a three-liter bladder in here to carry a lot of water when you're in 
hungry and things and it's 40 degrees and you're going, you know, four, four hours between stops, you need to carry a lot of water. Uh, and that all goes in there. And then uh, I stick all my Snickers and, and food bars in, in the main compartment <laughs> and Coca Cola. Yeah. Do you have a, a single food that keeps you going, that gives you a bit of a perk? No, I try and like eat lots of different things because you get really sick of eating the same thing because you're having to eat so much food. And Jesse Carlson, who organizes Indian Pacific Wheel Race, yeah. once said, and, and, and you know, many others have said it before, is it's essentially an, an eating competition with a bit of cycling in between. And, then, and that kind of summarizes how much you have so to So you're a champion eater. Yeah, re really, really. Uh, yeah, speed eater. You know, I could go. That Fantastic. Kind of <laughs> so you've come into ultra endurance racing from a pretty different standpoint from a lot of people, from a more of a racing and time trial background. Yeah. How did you make the switch? Ah, uh, well, just just made the transition. I kind of got bored of sitting in the car driving four hours to go to a race for, for three hours and probably get dropped off for the first 30 minutes and then do four hours back in the car. And I thought, I used to go away cycle touring at the end of every season and I really loved that. And I, I still had a competitive side and I thought, uh, how can I combine that and do something new and different because you can't keep hashing the same thing. And I'd seen Transcontinental and I thought it was the perfect way to combine my, my love of touring uh, and exploring quite quickly and my love of competitiveness and it's, it's been perfect and it's just took off ever since. And have you had to sacrifice anything uh, to train for and to come here to the Transcontinental? Uh, I haven't had to sacrifice anything but you should ask Isabel, my fiance, that question and uh, she'd probably give you probably a different answer. Probably give you a different answer, answer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And finally, but quite an interesting question, I'm sure lots of people were asking at home, how many pairs of shorts have you got, including the ones you're wearing? Uh, two. Well, yeah, two, including these ones. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, James, for your time, showing us a bit more about your bike and setup, and best of luck in the race. Thank you. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, make sure you subscribe to GCN and give us a like. And if you want to check out more on bikepacking with Josh, uh, if it's showing Sai in uh, Morocco how it's actually done and how to rough it like a champion, click here.